Um, so it's really great we could start this enrichment program with climate control, which climate control and climate change, which may, may well be the most important issue that faces this country and the world at the moment. Um, we have two global experts to talk about it here this morning. Barry and Moore, um, also our classmate from 1963. It is not true that Barry and Moore was invited to be on this panel because he was the best man in my wedding. <laughs> Beemore had and has had an extraordinary uh, career in science. He left here, uh, got his PhD at the University of, of Virginia in mathematics, was hired at the University of New Hampshire um, in mathematics, and uh, ultimately became a distinguished university professor there. He established an institute, I always think of it as kind of the memorial to be more himself, uh, in earth, oceans, and space. And ultimately, that institute that was built for B, uh, he presided over something like 80 sciences, uh, scientists in the study of, of climate. Um, he has uh, had a, a career, a global career. He has constantly been on the road all over the world for the last 30 years in environmental conferences of one sort or another. Uh, a real focus has been with NASA, and I'm happy to say that B was awarded by NASA the highest civilian award um, that NASA can give for distinguished um, public service. A few years ago, uh, the University of Oklahoma came calling uh, in the person of the former Senator uh, David Boren, now the president of the University of Oklahoma, who persuaded me to come to the University of Oklahoma. There he wears some really daunting hats. One is as um, he has a chair in, 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 um, in climate, and um, he is the dean of the School of Atmospheric and Geographic Sciences. Most daunting of all is that he's the director of the National Weather Center there in Torna Tornado Alley, that is a consortium of federal, state, and private interests uh, focusing on uh, climate and he's the vice president of uh, weather and climate programs at the university. An amazing, uh, amazing series of, of responsibilities. B is going to be jo uh, joined by a very popular and dynamic professor here at UNC, Jamie Bartram, who is himself a distinguished professor of environmental sciences and engineering here. He's an expert in uh, glo in uh, water resources, in global health and sanitation. He's the director of the Water Institute here at UNC. And in the last few years has been spearheading a campus theme on water uh, problems that uh, has, um, has been involved with uh, curriculum changes right across the university. So this is going to be a, a fabulous duo. I'm going to ensure that they each talk only 15 minutes so we have plenty of time to uh, lob questions at them. Dr. Moore. Uh, I'd like to begin by uh, thanking the alumni uh, society, the uh, Amanda from a development, uh, Jamie for willingness to do this with me on a beautiful day here in Chapel Hill, what Jimmy has done, but also I'd like to thank uh, this university uh, for what it has meant to my life. So I was honored to be here. Uh, this is what I'm going to talk about, what we know, what we think we know, and what we don't know, but uh, this is the challenge is we're going to do that in 15 minutes or less. And so what I'd like to do is uh, go quickly to what we know absolutely for sure, about which there's zero scientific debate. And it all stems from this remarkable record. Uh, in 1957, just as many of us were B 
beginning to think about going off to uh, university, there began talk of uh, the International Geophysical Year, IGY. And of course, what was most prominent in IGY is that led to the political and intellectual and scientific uh, environment in which Sputnik was launched. And some would say that was the greatest contribution to science. I don't know. I think that this record, which was begun uh, by David Keeling as a young postdoc from Scripps, where at Mauna Loa he begins to measure carbon dioxide. And this record continues today where his son actually oversees the record. And I talked to David and I said, David, what did you think when you first started seeing this record? And if you look right here, I realize it's very difficult to see, but look right here, all of a sudden it looked like CO2 was going like this. And David said, I think I'm going to have a very short postdoc. And then I, he said, well, what did you think when you saw the record turn around and go absolutely the other way? And he said, I then knew I was going to have a very short postdoc. I said, how about David when it turned around and started coming back up again? He said, I thought I'd get the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and the, uh, what he was seeing as he measured the concentration of CO2, he was seeing the annual cycle. That is the drawdown of CO2 in the northern hemisphere in spring and summer as vegetation lights up, and then the increase of CO2 as photosynthesis begins to shut down and respiration dominates. And so he sees the planetary biological cycle at the planetary scale. He also sees this, and that is the industrial planetary cycle of CO2 increasing because of the burning of fossil fuels. We're very certain it's the burning of fossil fuels for many reasons, and this is just one of them. This is the ice core data uh, from the dome core, and it's sitting right here at 280 parts per million up until the Industrial Revolution. And in the Industrial Revolution, we begin to replace human and animal labor by fossil fuels, which is wonderful, absolutely marvelous. And that continues today. And in fact, the green is the Mauna Loa record and the ice core data fits right in. It's because when snow falls, it chaps a little bit of the atmosphere. And you can go back, punch holes in ice, pull it out, and actually recover the past atmospheres. This is most exciting, if, and this is the last really technical thing we'll look at. If we look back, here's this 280 parts per million, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And you look back the last four ice ages. You see CO2 go down. Out of an ice age, it comes up. CO2 goes down as we enter ice age. It comes back up, always right back to 280. CO2 goes down. Now, the reason CO2 is going down it's because the oceans are cooling off. CO2 is more soluble in cold seawater. So what's happening is carbon is migrating from the land into the atmosphere as vegetation dies off, as the ice comes. All of that then goes into the ocean. And somehow, very quickly, as we come out of an ice age, it comes out of the ocean. And it comes right back to that 280 parts per million until humans began to burn fossil fuels. And what we're doing basically is just inflating the carbon cycle. Here's the inflation. This is the emissions, and this is the growth rate. And this is actually, I think, really quite exciting. This is the last decade. And in 2008, notice what happens. The emissions start to fall off. That's the recession, which also indicates the close coupling between energy and economic activity. In fact, you could actually have begun to see the fall off actually before the recession really hit. And this is the coming out of recession. In fact, we actually saw a growth rate in 2009 of negative 1%. We're back to 5.9% growth rate. This is how you might partition that growth rate out. And what we see is the US was fairly constant. That's actually the US entering the recession a little bit early as the CO2 began to fall off in terms of an emission. And here's China. China doesn't even see the recession in terms of the burning of fossil fuels. The Chinese uh, burning is increasing at about 10% per year. Now, we might then say, well, that's all China's fault. Well, actually, they're producing goods, which we're buying. And so we've just offshored some of our emissions. And this really has to be viewed as a global problem. It doesn't matter who's burning it. It's all going into the same atmosphere. When it goes into the atmosphere, about half stays in the atmosphere. 
about half goes, a quarter goes back into forests and about a quarter goes into the ocean. Now, that's good. About half of it goes away, but half of it stays. So that means actually stabilizing the emissions, it would still increase in the atmosphere because half would be going in every year. So this is what we know absolute for sure. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, that is it traps heat. The atmospheric concentration is increasing. The increase is being caused primarily by the burning of fossil fuels. Fossil fuel consumption is at the center of almost all the economies on the planet. And CO2 lasts a long time in the atmosphere. So stopping the increase is going to be difficult. Those things we know for sure. What we think we know. Well, we could go to the scientific literature, uh, day after tomorrow, Michael Crichton's state of fear. I don't want to go there. These would be the places that I would turn. Uh, uh, if we look at the IPCC, I know about East Anglia. I know about Climate Gate. Uh, but this is still probably the best assessment we have. Uh, in 2001, uh, we had the third assessment. In 2007, we had the fourth assessment. In 2001, this is what we said, we have a collective picture of a warming world. In 2007, this was the statement, warming of the, clients of the climate system is unequivocal. So, collective picture of a warming world, unequivocal. In 2001, we said that uh, it, the warming was likely attributable to human activities. In IPCC speak, the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, what that means is, Two out of three. Uh, by 2007, very likely. That means nine out of ten. So you say, well, yeah, but I know about climate gate. I don't trust any of that. Then I would turn your attention to a very important document. And that was in October 2011 of the Defense Science Board of the United States, Trends and Implications of Climate Change for National and International Security. Two dominant themes in that report. One was on changes in precipitation. Jamie's going to be talking about the importance of the water cycle. I won't dwell there. And the other is changes in the Arctic. This is what the Arctic looked like in September 2008, uh, 80. Uh, that's the ice cover. Um, we're not very good at geography, all of us. Uh, so how big is that? It's just about the same size as the 48 states. This is what, again, it looked like in September 2000, uh, 1980. By 2007, uh, the red area had melted away. That would be as if we just carved off everything east of the Mississippi, plus North Dakota, and South Dakota, half of it. We would also have, in 2007, two passages from the uh, Atlantic to the Pacific through the Arctic Ocean. Of real concern is you're taking a white object and you're turning it dark. And what that does is it decreases the reflectivity of the planet in the summertime, which increases warming because you decrease the reflectivity. More heat is absorbed. So this is what we think we know. The planet is warming very likely because of human activities. Uh, the increase in global temperatures will alter rainfall uh, because if you're warming the planet, you're going to evaporate more water. If you evaporate more water, you've got to rain more water. So you're going to change precipitation. And the climate of the planet will continue to change even after you stabilize CO2 in the atmosphere, which is very difficult to do because of things like, well, once you've melted off the ice caps and you make the planet darker, that doesn't have anything to do with CO2 per se, but the climate will feed off of that. So what do we not know? Well, I want to go back to my history in this. I left mathematics up after about 10 years and I went down to Woods Hole Oceanographic to study uh, oceanography and from that to what I currently work on. And while I was there, there was this marvelous book of the United States Atomic Energy Commission, Carbon in the Biosphere, and this was the result of a major conference in Woods Hole that really changed my life in many ways. And as we uh, uh, had that conference, I met a young postdoc, Charlie Hall, who's uh, just retiring from Syracuse now. And uh, Charlie was told he had to put the conference together and no, he wasn't gonna give a paper, he just needed to bind it all up and come up with a cover for the book. And Charlie said, I'm a scientist, I don't do this. George Woodwell, then director of the Marine Biological Laboratory said, Charlie, this is what you're doing. So Charlie started working on the book 
And he had a girlfriend in Australia. So he said, well, I think I'll just move Australia in a little closer so that she's closer. And then Charlie said, I wonder if anyone would notice if we put Africa instead of South America here. <laughs> so what I tell Charlie is what we should have done is title the book Carbon in the Biosphere and its Impact on Plate Tectonics, you know. <laughs> but here's what we... Here's what we don't know. Changes in severe weather and extreme events, and that is extremely important and extremely difficult. We really don't know if there are more hurricanes or fewer. Some indication of increase in, uh, in, in the power of hurricanes, but it's, it's weak. What will be the changes in of precipitation? We know they're going to change. What will it look like? We think that probably dry areas will get drier, wet areas will get wetter, but we really don't know. Uh, what really is going to be the fate of the Arctic? Uh, it may be that you open up more ice, evaporate more water, you evaporate the water, it makes more clouds, the clouds are white to cool the Arctic off, and we just fall back into the Arctic as we knew it. We don't know. Uh, wh what about the significant changes in Antarctica? We don't know. And what we do not know is what we do not know. Surprises are surprises. And what we really do not know is how do you swap out the energy system of the planet that we currently have and move in an energy system that is less fossil fuel centric and do that in a way that does not create havoc with the economy. We do not know how to do this. Which brings me to a final thought. I'd like to read this because I realize some of this is hard to see. So I'll read this to you. From Norm Augustine, CEO of Lockheed Martin, Under Secretary of the Army. One thing that is clear based upon my own career in industry and government is that when faced with major challenges of high technological content in a time of austerity, the last thing one should underfund is research and development. To do so is the equivalent of removing an engine from an overloaded aircraft in order to save weight. This is what gives me confidence, though. This university, this university knows that with change, there is challenge and there's also opportunity. Thank you very much. Thanks, Biran, for a great uh, first, session, first introductory session for, for our talks today. Uh, I'd also like to uh, provide my thanks on to the association for the invitation to be, to be with you here, um, and to Jim for an introduction in which I think you described me as popular and dynamic. I've never heard any of my students tell me that. Um, <laughs> maybe there's something to learn from. Now, you will probably have learned or already appreciated from my, from my accent that I can't claim to be either a Tar Heel born or a Tar Heel bred, and I'm hoping the next bit is going to wait for a few years. So, but, so I'm a relative newbie to this university, and I've been here for three years, and picking up on the very theme that B ended on, um, I came to UNC in part because it's a university with a reputation for drawing together hard, high-quality science with practical implications in the world of policy and practice. That's a really appealing combination. It is something to which I and many others here feel it very, very easy to come in. And yet, if we pick up that, that theme of uncertainty that we were left with, it leaves, leaves me asking, well, what are the practical implications? What can we actually do confronted by perhaps one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century? And if we pick up that, I, those IPCC reports that Miriam referred to, we see uh, a certain degree, a certain degree of likelihood of changes in the frequency of extreme events. Events like warm spells and heat waves, uh, the frequency of heavy precipitation events, uh, the ex aerial extent of, of drought as well as flood, uh, tropical cyclone activity and so on. And as we look at consecutive um, time periods, we see 
an increasing likelihood of those, those events occurring. Um, and we also see in parallel in the popular press and in the scientific media reports of the consequences of those kinds of events. And those consequences can be quite extreme, they can be costly, and they can impact on, on ordinary lives. Um, 2012 was last year, I think. Um, we saw Hurricane Sandy. And the impact of that, impacts of that hurricane, I think, are probably um, engraved on our minds. The financial cost of that hurricane in the US was somewhere a little over $70 billion. And the US was only one of the affected countries. It had, that hurricane had large effects elsewhere also. Um, we go into the, uh, to a different phenomenon. We also see effects of excess rainfall, or more intense rainfall. Uh, precipitation, these, the two examples, or two of the examples I will use here come from the other side of the Atlantic. Um, a flood at a single water treatment plant in the United Kingdom. A water treatment plant that already thought it had adaptation measures in place uh, overwhelmed that facility and meant that 350,000 people, that's a lot, 350,000, yeah, uh, were without water for two to three weeks, 17 days. Um, enormous volumes of, of bottled water were distributed in an attempt to actually make sure those people had some form of supply. Let's go to the other extreme and we move to Kampala in Uganda and we see uh, protected springs which are used as the day-to-day -day water source for these people. Um, springs that have been invested in to try and make them relatively safe, completely overwhelmed by rainfall that was outside the established pattern, outside what people had been used to coping with over a decade or more. Uh, and another example again in the U U UK, uh, a single flood event on a single water river basin uh, led to 37 wastewater treatment plants, including some large water treat wastewater treatment plants, all being out of action. An enormous environmental contamination from the sewage that, that resulted from that. And again, just last year in the US, we saw the impacts of, of droughts, of, of, of drying climate behaviors. Um, Last year's drought, I'm going to look across to B, where is he? I think it was officially categorized as moderate drought conditions in, in two-thirds of the affected area. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. Uh, the cost, as presently counted, is around $35 billion in the Midwestern economies and probably in increasing. So these phenomena appear to be frequent. They appear to be very costly. And um, what I would like to dwell on a little bit is, well, what can we do about that? Is this future just something that's inevitable, or is it something that we can respond to, to adapt to? Humankind has a great history of responding and improving its own future. And the work of my, my own group here uh, focuses on implications for drinking water systems. So if we, if we go through these kinds of events, well, floods can cause physical disruption and contamination and energy interruptions, so systems can't work. Droughts uh, lead to intermittent supply of water. Saline intrusion uh, in, into, into water supplies and forces to use less safe sources. Uh, tropical cyclones can affect both the quantity and the quality of water available to us. And in coastal areas where most of our global population lives, those things can come together and exacerbate the effects. So part of our work is trying to understand how can we minimize the, the loss of safe water access when we know that's such a big deal for such large populations worldwide? And the, the flow of my presentation broadly follows this. It's a simple logic that says, what, what do we understand about the problem, the practical problem? What do we understand about how we might go about managing it? What is going on about applying the solutions? And then can we check that that's all working properly? Is there a feedback loop? So if we look at understanding the problems, we've spent the last two years, um, sorry, let's start with this. There are different things going on here at UNC in trying to do that. I'll just pick out two examples. Uh, recently installed in Chapman Hall uh, is this large wave tank. A wave tank can help us look at different phenomena, whether they are coastal erosion related to the waves themselves, movement of, of, of pollutants, um, 
and the effects of the waves directly on physical infrastructures. And that's a collaboration across the campus here. And one of the things it's doing at the moment is looking at the impact of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the movement of oil in different suspended forms, and that, how that relates to transport and degradation. Uh, in my own group, one of the things we're trying to do is understand at a very large scale just how vulnerable we are, us and populations worldwide, to the, the damaging effects of ex extreme climate events on our water systems, on our sewerage systems, and so on. And to do that, we, we take our understanding of the likelihood of events, we, we overlay information on population, we look at the technologies that are being applied and how resilient they are, and, and how well different systems have adapted. Bearing in mind that example from the Mythe water treatment plant, where they thought they had adapted, and yet an extreme, extreme event, a surprise, an unknown unknown, overwhelmed their own adaptation. And we have uh, data from, from p clever people that, that work very large data sets on the recent uh, prevalence of each of those different forms of, of weather event. And we've got very good quality data worldwide on population density. So we can overlay those two things and understand how the population is, is exposed to problems. What you can't really see from this map is the extreme concentration of populations around the very edges of our continents. And we can, we've undertaken analysis of the different technology options to work out what's relatively safe and secure. That a, a well that takes water from a large resilient aquifer may be able to buffer extremes from year to year. Uh, a river system, which is extremely variable depending on rainfall, may, may be much more fragile, for example. And by doing that, we, could, we can give a relative assessment to the fragility, the vulnerability of systems to these events. And then finally, we can overlay on that just how well, how well are our governments doing in trying to prepare. And different countries worldwide are adapting preparing in different ways. Uh, in some, there is a, an emphasis on improving the systems on which we depend. In others, there is an emphasis on being able to respond when things go wrong, a sort of FEMA version of, of, of adaptation. And in others, those two things are being done together. And if we multiply those things out, it's for those that enjoy spreadsheets, there's a lot of numbers involved in this. We can look at all the different technologies, all the different events, and all the different populations, and start to understand global vulnerability to this. Now, the first time we did this work, we thought we should look at countries. Um, and we found some uh, interesting relationships. In countries like Mexico and the US, the way in which we have developed our infrastructure, the way in which governments respond, has tended to mean that even if there is quite a high risk of, of a problem occurring, we're actually in quite good shape for managing it. That's the good news. Uh, in many countries, that's not true. And if we look at countries like Ethiopia, where there's a dependency on, on shallow wells that draw water from very shallow aquifers, they become more vulnerable. So a risky technology choice leads to increased population vulnerability. And we can describe that at a very large scale, compare countries with, with, with countries. This is for drought alone, and we can also composite these maps to look at o overall vulnerability. And this is quite reassuring, because the, the US looks quite, quite green. That's what happens when we overlay the resilience of the systems. The U US is in the lowest category of risk, and you'll see those other countries I mentioned. You'll be pleased to see that Africa's where it belongs, and Australia's where it belongs, and the Geophysical Union didn't actually manage that plate tectonics. Um, and we can see then, as we, as we add the, the overlay of how well adapted we are, countries become more resilient. Populations are less at risk. And the, as I've gone through those maps, you, I'm going to go back, you see the amount of, if we begin at the beginning, here we see overall exposure, a lot of red, a lot of orange. Here we see the red and orange declining because the investments we have in infrastructures. And then we see them re declining still further. So a limited number of countries with, with very large vulnerability. Now that was the first credible assessment 
that had been undertaken worldwide. Um, and in parallel with it, we were working with UNICEF. Now, UNICEF is one of the biggest actors in bringing water to least, uh, to least supplied populations worldwide. And I think it's fair I, I can say to, to this room that when we did that work, we had a very uncomfortable conclusion for UNICEF. In many of the countries they were operating, business as usual wasn't climate change resilient. That the things they were investing in were not going to keep working, not even for their projected working lives. And that implied a major change in the way that they needed to do business. And it was very difficult for that agency, just as it is difficult for governments worldwide. And then we started to think, well, the very large countries, the US, Brazil, China, Australia, and so on, there's a big averaging going on when we do that. So the US is low risk. Now, the US, I've worked out since I've been here, it's quite a big place, isn't it? So what happens if we start to drill down? And this is the work we've been doing in the last year. Who lives in North Carolina? Can I just check that? This is great, because you can all spot where you are on the map and worry about what color it looks. But we did the same exercise in North Carolina, drilling right down, and we're now trying to move that into um, a much finer scale. And we can look at the likelihood of drought. Then you see the vulnerability, where the risk is overall, whoops, sorry, reduced. Same, pro same approach, same logic, and now we're trying to work with individual utilities to try and overlay on that. In terms of managing the problems, well, UNC is working internationally. The, the CLEAR Center is working with countries to improve transboundary water management, and it works with the UN system to bring those solutions to different countries worldwide. And in my group, we're working on a preventive safety management approach called water safety planning. We're actually working, we've started in the last few months, working with utilities here in North Carolina to understand how they can adapt to reduce risk. Reduce risk in their day-to-day -day operations and reduce the risks that arise from potential, from extreme events that may arise from, from, from climate change. I can't tell you the results of that because we're still doing the work and the utilities have said we don't want to let on how they're doing. That's all part of what people, what people are now referring to as no regrets adaptations. And no regrets adaptations are exactly what they sound like. There are things that we can do that will increase our resilience. There are things we ought to do anyway and would benefit from doing. There are things as basic as water conservation measures uh, and reducing leakage, lost water. And so a lot of the current emphasis then is on these kinds of, inter of, of adaptations that cost very little uh, and we, things that we would benefit from in, in any case. And we're also working towards applying those solutions. So here at UNC, the Institute for Marine Studies uh, developed, this is a terrible acronym, A-D-C-I-R-C, ADSERC. Uh, but that provides practical, timely information on surge and inundation arising from, from hurricanes and so on that is now wired in to agencies uh, along the coast in order that they can plan and adapt accordingly. And we are doing similar work internationally with the United Nations Environment Program. We prepared this guidebook on practical adaptation measures that could be adopted by governments in developing countries wor worldwide. Things as diverse as desalinating water and increasing water efficiency on reducing leakage and on collecting and recycling, reusing rainwater. And then finally, we need to close that loop back and say, well, we think we've been very clever mapping the risks, understanding what we can do, and applying the adaptations. Does it really work? And again, at UNC, we've got groups looking at new and novel, practical, applicable ways to understand whether these things are actually working in practice. And Rachel Noble, who's that, who's that lady in the picture there, has recently patented uh, a very simplified and much more rapid testing approach to see whether the pollution that is not being generated upstream is leading to improved water conditions as we move down towards our coasts. I'd like to wrap up with, a, with a, an attempt or a comment that's intended to generalize. I said when I, when I began speaking that I'm here in part because UNC is a university that can draw together hard science with practical policy and practice implications. 
Uh, and sometimes when I make this presentation, I refer to a speech made by Hillary Clinton, where she described water as one of the greatest challenges of our time. And I think those, comment, those words make sense. She refers to, in fact, that quote at the front, I think is almost verbatim her, her words, represents one of the greatest development opportunities of our time, impacting health, agriculture, security, the economy, and the environment. Now, that's a very broad and all-encompassing challenge. And if you look at the evidence, it supports that. The lack of water and sanitation already kills more people than HIV, AIDS, malaria, and accidents, which are the, the big killers, all combined. Drought, we talked about drought and its economic impact here, but drought is a matter of life and death for subsistence farmers worldwide. And when we have a drought here in the US, we see a rise in agricultural product prices. But the other impact is that means that staples are less available in the developing world. Staples like corn, which feed millions worldwide. There's an intelligence community assessment that released last year that reports that water-related problems could, are likely to, I think is the phrase used, lead to instability of countries uh, that may lead to state failure, com country failure. And that same report also concludes that water shortages and pollution could adversely, severely adversely affect economic performance by impacting things like ener energy generation, manufacturing, and resource extraction. Now, when I read this report, my reaction was, well, this is the sort of thing that the, intelligent, that the security community works on, the intelligence uh, and security communities. And it always tells us how bad the, the news is. What was really interesting, the, the, the closing statement in that report is not a bad news item. The closing statement is, if we manage water better, we can cope with all of those challenges. I think that's quite a remarkable closing, closing statement despite the fact that as we look forward towards, for example, 2025, something approaching two billion people on our planet will be living in regions of absolute water scarcity. UNC is responding to that challenge, and it's responding at lar large scale. My institute was created only, only three years ago and is an attempt to bring together strengths from across campus. And the university adopted a campus-wide theme to do that, to pursue those, those same ends. I think it's important that we recognize that in the very earliest years of this university, managing things like water were part of the agenda. They were part of the agenda because they were essential to the development of a then young and underdeveloped state. <coughs> Building ports, harbors, managing water was part of what this university first produced grad graduates to do. Oops. We all know this, this well, yes? Everyone's drunk from this at some point because this is obviously the lucky group, right? <laughs> it's not that long ago that the well that was on that location served as the water source, singular, for the residences that we all know as Old East and Old West. It was only in the 1920s that it was converted to that very attractive form we see today. In almost exactly the same year that that very attractive well was built, there was a survey of tenant farmers in this state. And in that survey, not one had running water. And eight out of 175 had even an outside privy. And just in case anyone's in any doubt, the ones that didn't have an outside privy didn't have an inside privy. Yeah? <laughs> UNC contributed to changing the condition of North Carolina. It contributed to overcoming those problems. And what's happening today is helping not only in this state, but in places like Zambia, which has exactly the conditions today that North Carolina had in the 1920s. UNC is stepping forward to deal both at state level and internationally with a defining challenge of the 21st century. Thank you.
answer less. I've made a short list of what we know and don't know. Uh, but let me be clear about a few things. Uh, the loss of Arctic sea ice uh, is not changing the sea levels because that water, the ice, is already in the ocean. So if it melts, uh, the thing that would change would be that you would have a slight thermal expansion because you're heating up the ocean ever so slightly. And that would uh, lead to sea level rise. In fact, about half the sea level, we had about eight inches. About half is due to thermal expansion. The oceans are warmer. And about half is due to grounded ice melting and water coming in. So that's the reason I put up Antarctica as the big unknown. What happens if a major piece of Antarctica goes from grounded ice to into the ocean? And that is something we don't know, and that's a big, big question. One other thing, there is something else that is happening, in, and uh, I had the great opportunity to be at the mathematics department yesterday and in the uh, wave tank, and also to uh, meet with the new chair of uh, the applied physical sciences uh, department. Uh, and what they're looking at is the influence of, as you melt the Arctic, you're freshening ever so slightly, you're adding fresh water to the North Atlantic. And one thing we now know is that in the North Atlantic, a lot of water goes down like this and takes carbon with it. And the reason it does that is as the water goes north, it gets colder. And as the water goes north, it gets saltier because ice is forming. And that makes it heavier, and you get this downward motion of water in the North Atlantic. That's very important. It's one of the things that helps stabilize climate. But you're now freshening that. That is, it's getting less heavy as you put that fresh water out of it. We don't know what happens to the North Atlantic. And that was one of the things that Chapel Hill is doing, trying to understand this bottom, it's called bottom water formation. And this is really extraordinary. Oh, sorry. Yeah, take this one first. Have you looked at uh, the possible risk to our aquifers as a result of fracking? And if so, have you been able to draw any conclusions? We, uh, we've done some work on that. I work with the Institute of Medicine, for example, on trying to understand. Sorry. I think, is that still on? No? Okay. I'll come over here and hope we've got both microphones. And maybe we should both, we, we do a double act and use this thing here. So the, the risk of fracking then, uh, yes, we've done some work looking at it. I've been working with the Institute of Medicine to try, to try and understand that. There is, if we review the risks that we see, the honest truth, and this is quite unpopular to say, is that the greatest risks to, to, to health, for example, are, are not from the ground, groundwater systems. The greatest risks to health actually come from the operations, the, the things that people are doing on the surface. They're occupational health hazards. Where, where do we become concerned about fracking? There is a lot of spoken concern about the volume of water that's used. And rather like Beren's comment about, well, this is water we've already accounted for, that's probably not that well-founded. The concern that I don't think we've yet adequately tackled is the large quantities of wastewater that are generated at the surface and we find very difficult to manage. Now, some operations are looking at cleaning that water and injecting it back down the wells directly, which at face value seems to make sense. Uh, some operations are ponding or impounding those large volumes of water and we don't know the impact of that. So there are credible reports of uh, leakage of some contaminants uh, in, especially in sh very shallow fracking operations, of which there are very few, and potentially from gas escape. So it's not the water itself that moves around, it's the, the gas that migrates through. I think that the truth is that a well-managed fracking operation is, is unlikely to lead to groundwater contamination of health concern. But the things we do while we're moving uh, the, the operation will lead to introduction of contaminants and movement of contaminants. Most of those are perfectly manageable if we regulate effectively. There's a question over here. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you care to comment at all on why the projections and uh, planning steps taken by the U.S. Department of Defense were forbidden for planning purposes by the North Carolina State Legislature Thank you.
question. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't follow that. Is that your name? North Carolina State, I don't know. <laughs> I have enough problem with Oklahoma. <laughs> Uh, could you be more specific? Which which changes you're referring to? I understood that projections. I understand your caution too. Of that the projections for purposes of the state of North Carolina's planning, based upon a rising uh, a prediction of a rising effect of climate change. Yep. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I was I was still on fracking, and I was confused about where the the, the question came from. I th I think this is something maybe both of us should comment on. But it's it's a statement of fact that short, medium range projections are extremely unreliable. You've heard from Biran how how little we understand the underlying dynamics and mechanisms, and therefore the long term perspective, the the ability of climatologists to give us projections in the kind of planning horizons that I, I work with, where we're looking at infrastructure investments, for example, which are certainly less than 100 years and for a large extent less than 50 years. It's a statement of fact that they, they are not reliable. And that's why the, the emphasis I gave in the presentation wasn't highly dependent on understanding precisely what weather we are going to encounter in location X or location Y. I think I'm going to turn to you to comment more on that, but I, I think that is an, not a sound basis for practical investment planning. What we do know is that most of these events are, have seen an increasing frequency and that the evidence we have suggests that that frequency will increase. That is something we can plan and adapt to, and that was intended to be the underlying message of what I said. As for the legislature, I wouldn't dare to comment. <laughs> Um, one of the real hard problems, and not to get into the te technology too much of, of weather versus climate, but we know that the weather system has um, certain chaotic aspects to it, and that limits how far you can make a reliable forecast into the future because very small differences will ripple out into the future looking out, say, 10, 12, 14-day forecasts. And, and that's because, uh, going back to Phillips Hall now, that's because mathematically a weather problem is what's called an initial value problem. That is, I know what it is now, and I try to project, project it into the future. The climate system is different. It's what we call a boundary value problem. That is, the changes in climate are coming because of changes in the boundary, namely how much energy is coming in versus how much energy is getting out because of the changes in greenhouse gases. And those things are well understood as you look further out, but they're very hard when they start rubbing up against the weather problem because they're just different objects. For instance, I can make a very conclusive forecast for July of uh, next year. Uh, it's not gonna snow in New York City in July of next year. And that's because that's, that's really getting kind of into the the, the things that are very stable in the weather climate system. To end this long monologue, uh, what you have to almost go back to is what Jamie says. One thing we really know are what are happening. And so if we start looking at what is happening, we in some ways need to use that as part of our uh, information about the future. Uh, we're looking at what is happening. Well, the, the number answer to that, I, I can't give you a, a number prediction on that. So the question was, sorry, we should do that consistently. The gentleman's from Texas. I prefer North Carolina. Everyone has their own taste. Um, the Ogallala, Ogallala Aquifer is a major non-renewable resource that underpins the, the southwest or a large area of the southwest. When do I think it will run dry? I think that was the, the question. And I will be the evasive scientist uh, and say that's got lots of uncertainties around it. But just like the other things we're talking about, there are things that we can be very, we can be, be certain of. 
Uh, first of all, that's what we would call a, a fossil aquifer. It's not, it's not renewed. So it's not water flowing in to, to balance. Or there's some flowing in, but essentially we're extracting the water from that, and it's a, it's a one-way exploitation. Secondly, the more that we draw down, the more we lower the level in aquifers like that, we see water quality changes. And it's a bit like when you get to the bottom of your kitchen sink and that's where all the pieces, all the bits and pieces are and it's really quite, yeah. Aquifers are a little like that. The, the bottom of an aquifer tends to be very mineral rich. And that's often not suitable for some of the purposes we put it to. So that aquifer is being drawn, drawn down primarily for agriculture. That's the largest exploiter worldwide. It's about 70% of all extractions. And as this is not the only fossil aquifer that's behaving in that way, as we draw them down to very low levels, we will see water quality changes. The other things we, we know, this is another one of these, what do we know, know for sure? One, we've got huge capacity to amend the way we use water and to be far more efficient in agricultural applications. And if we look at some of the, the driest countries that have been most aggressive in applying more efficient irrigation methods, they've managed to collapse the volumes that are used. And I say that because it means you can draw down the aquifer rapidly and use it inefficiently, or you can use that water very efficiently and draw it much more slowly. That's up to us. There is some cost in being efficient, and the benefits are downstream. They're next generation benefits. So there's a sort of an intergenerational equity issue going on. The other is that we can, we can decide to replenish that aquifer. Now, not at the same pace that we're drawing down, but people are now looking at ways to put wastewater back into aquifer systems. Now, it doesn't work everywhere, and we can never put in as much as we take out because we're inefficient in how we use it. But there, there are options to put at least some water back in. If we, th we think about, um, just picture for a moment, sorry, the question was, um, why is the water use in fracking not a big issue? Because we have water restrictions. That would be, I think, a simple summary of it. Yeah. I, I think the, picture for a moment the, the state of North Carolina. We, we have, I've noticed in the last week, quite a lot of rainfall. In my yard, we've probably got more than, more than the amount of rainfall I'd like to have. Um, most of the water that, that falls flows through the system and is recycled through the large planetary system that we, we be, that's being described. Uh, in this state, a small fraction enters, enters aquifers and groundwater systems. So the idea we don't have enough water is something that we have the ability to manage and control. Water is, is the infinitely renewable resource. It's not like fossil fuels, the example we used earlier, where there is a, a finite fixed amount, they're not being replenished in any meaningful sense, and we are extinguishing them. Water systems recycle continuously, and the challenge to humankind is not sharing out the amount we have, but working out how do we recycle and reuse. Most of our rivers are already reuse systems. We don't take the water out, use it, and it's finished. We take the water out, we use it, we put it back in again, it's used again, it's put back in again, it's used again, it's put back in again. So that the, the, a water system works in that way. Groundwater is special for us because it acts as a very, very big storage tank. So we can draw on, on groundwater, and as long as it's being replenished, that will give us interannual stability because the volumes are massive, but the throughput is very slow. You, you raise the question in, in the context of fracking. The issue with fracking is fracking as a routine operation doesn't use a lot of water. Fracking uses a lot of water to establish the wells in the first place. So it's a, it's a one-off demand. And I've not seen 
any assessments that suggest that that one or, uh, sorry, that's not quite true. I've not seen any assessments on the East Coast that suggest that one-off demand is a substantive call relative to the amount of water we have available to us. Do you want to come in on that as well? Yeah. Questions here, there are two right side by side. But. Uh, it'll depend a little bit about where I'll draw the boundary, namely uh, the, the, almost the topic we just had, the, the production of fossil fuel, either natural gas or, or coal or oil, there is an energy cost in the production. But just putting the most simple uh, uh, case forward, uh, uh, natural gas is about three times as energy efficient as coal between half and three times as, uh, between twice and three times as efficient. And that's simply because it's a higher quality fuel and it produces more energy units per CO2 release. So uh, I have thought at times in Norman, Oklahoma, as these long train cars go by from uh, Wyoming down to Texas, uh, one and two mile long trains taking coal, that you'd probably be better off just uh, using the natural gas that come in pipeline. The main problem is cost. Coal is cheap. Okay, so it's, yeah. So the the question was, would I would we expand on the impact of uh, tropical storm and similar events on water supply, in essence? Um, and the the question you 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 caveated it talking about treatment plants, uh, and I'd like to take a step back for a moment and say that a lot of the disruption we see in the reliability of water supply is not only at the level of the treatment plant; it's things as basic as energy interruption. So we use a lot of energy to pump water and get it to people. If your electricity system goes down, you might manage to have a standby generator that will run a treatment plant. Your ability to move large volumes of very heavy water out to consumers is actually very reduced. So your first risk is actually an energy risk, an energy security risk. Um, the second uh, is physical physically overwhelming the facility. Now, I use the example of Mythe because it's very graphic and I wish I'd had some, some video to show it. But that was a place that had, had been bunded. It had got a, an earth bank around it to try and protect it. Um, and in principle, as long as there was energy, that was going to keep working. Uh, you overtop that, that earth bank like a levee, the system can't, can't function. Uh, there are systems that in theory could continue to work. They're fully closed systems that are pressurized. But in practice, if you think about a physical plant, once it's flooded out, you can't physically operate it. It's, it's if practically in, in, impossible. The, question, the, the last question, which is the one where, where you came in then, is well, what about the water quality challenges that make the, the treatment systems collapse or, or start to fail? And the reason I was cautious in responding to the question was because those same quality challenges we get much, uh, we get, we see uh, with much smaller events than, than a full tropical cyclone. So we are challenged frequently by major water quality problems with turbidity and so on. And the truth is that we can, we have the technologies to treat almost any water. Uh, the question is one of cost and volume production. And if we're designing and building treatment systems for one or two days of very bad quality, that's an extremely expensive way to do business. Um, if we can moderate the incoming quality, either because we manage the environment better or through the simple ability to can actually run our water supplies for more efficiently than if we're always planning for the worst, worst case event. So energy, then overwhelming, then quality. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's the it's. Sorry, the question was, and correct me if I don't re rephrase this. Yeah. It's, it's, in practice, it's very similar uh, to an ordinary flood or extreme weather, we, weather event. Most treatment plants are designed that they will cut off for short periods when water quality is at its worst. And that's the simple efficiency factor because the normal way we do the first phase of purification, so to remove your solids and your suspended, suspended materials, um, does not, uh, is not easily operable uh, over very wide ranges, which is what we see in an ordinary river system. It doesn't actually make much difference whether it's uh, a, a river or marine system or a coastal system. Groundwater is very different because groundwater you have all of the um, natural infiltration to protect it. So we normally think of groundwaters as extremely low in sediment, grit and, and so on. And the treatment is only for specific chemicals. So typically a groundwater system is far more resilient. And some of those maps I showed, some of the color coding is to account for that. The groundwater system is typically much more resilient than a surface water system. Question here. Development of title. It was development of title, and what should we do as citizens? Well, let's see. Uh, what we should, should we do as citizens, and how about title power? Um, I think as citizens, uh, I've often felt that I would like that David Keeling Mauna Loa record uh, that I showed. I think that'd be on, on every gas pump in America, so that at least you're reminded that this is a, there's more than a scarcity issue, there's a consumption issue. Uh, I would like us to think, I would like to think that uh, if we could really be very aggressive on conservation, that would be a way out of this problem of climate change. I, I don't think that. I think it's just too tough. Uh, the, uh, to try to stabilize the concentration in the atmosphere, you almost have to take fossil fuel consumption down to zero. And that's going to be extremely difficult to do, just extremely difficult. So conservation, I think, lowers the bar in terms of what you have to then do. But I think we're going to have to become very aggressive on the use of wind and uh, solar. And we may have to rethink our approach to nuclear. However, I think the uh, Japanese experience uh, and the cost uh, make nuclear a very tough option. Uh, but I do think that we could do better on the use of solar and, uh, and uh, wind. I will say that I think, and I made a uh, comment a few moments ago about natural gas to burn coal, then we have to have carbon sequestration. Namely, the CO2 has got to be captured and put underground. Uh, coal is just an inefficient fuel. And so the simple answer would be we ought to replace coal with natural gas, use natural gas as the fuel of choice for the fossil era, and then try to migrate as quickly as possible to solar and wind. Yes. Follow up. That would be the uh, that in fact that would tie the two talks together. Exactly. If we could uh, take water, split hydrogen off from the oxygen, burn the hydrogen, what you make is water. You oxidize the hydrogen. You're back to H2O, and now you have a closed loop. Just a tough, tough problem to date in terms of really being able to do that efficiently. I, I, can I come in on the side? I've got a, the mic here is working. Just picking up your original question for a moment. I was at a presentation given by Lester Brown uh, about a month ago, uh, and he expressed the same thing extremely eloquently. And he, was, he, he, he said, I need to make the case to you about how big this, this issue is. And he used very similar words. And in the end, he said, think back to the 19, 19, 1930s, 1940s. This country went on a war footing. It moved its entire industrial production, its entire economic system behind one objective. We need 
that level of commitment today. That was his statement. And then he debugged some of the myths, and I'm, I, you feel free to correct me on any of those, but for example, he said, we get very ex excited about biofuels. We could stop producing any food on the planet. We could convert the whole planet to biofuels. It's not gonna move many cars. It's a drop in the ocean. When we look at the way we use energy, we're not gonna stop using energy. And we need ways to get enough energy to allow us to do the kinds of things that we do today. And it's not going to be from that kind of source. He would be a fan of, of um, wind. He did raise tidal, which was the issue you, you began with. Uh, and he raised solar as the, the practical means of the future. And that leaves you with a problem because you've got no portable fuels. We need liquid or gas type fuels for, thi for things that move from Get A airplanes. to B. You can't run a plane on solar panels. You, you need to put something in the engines. Right. Yeah? Uh, I think the biofuel uh, just shows you the power of the corn lobby. It really does make sense in terms of energy. It's, it's a feel-good technology. Makes you feel good. You know, we see biofuels. You could turn the entire grain business, all grain, no food, turn all of it into fuels, and it's something like... 25% of the gas budget today. And that's just gasoline. So it really is uh, not a, a very... And also, that doesn't include how much energy goes into the system of trying to produce that corn ethanol. It's just, it's just the power of the corn lobby. Okay, the question has to do with cap and trade. Uh, I know this question pretty well because uh, I had fierce arguments in my family about the logic of cap-and-trade. I think that uh, cap-and-trade is just a gold mine for fibbers. <laughs> that, uh, I mean, it's just so easy to game. Uh, these carbon flows are very, very big numbers, and there's a lot of uncertainty in there. So uh, when the original idea of cap and trade uh, was used uh, particularly in, in, uh, in England and then in the United States to manage uh, acid production or sulfur dioxides and, and nitrous oxides out of very fixed power plants. We knew where the power plants were, we could monitor the stack, and you could actually make a measurement. Uh, carbon dioxide is a much different thing. I mean, a lot of it goes back in the ocean. It, you have terrestrial sources, you have terrestrial sinks. You could game this thing all day long. Uh, a much simpler thing would just be a carbon tax. Uh, because uh, you just, just tax the carbon in fossil fuels, and you could use that tax, actually, to tie back over here, you could use that tax to drive consumptions in different ways. Tax carbon heavily, and you drive consumption away from coal and towards natural gas. So I think that there are far better ways than the uh, cap and trade and a big carbon tax. Of course, it, that has the... Uh, that's the T word. I think we have to end this mainly because Barian has to get to his commencement in um, Norman, Oklahoma tonight, or whatever. It's just like here, except I look out and see blue. There you look out and see crimson. <laughs> yeah. So Barian, would you just end by saying what the nature of this ceremony is at the University of Oklahoma and how, how maybe we could have this in North Carolina? Yes, this might uh, appeal to North Carolinians. Uh, the academic processional is just like here. It's in the football stadium, uh, we think, trying to forecast rain tonight. Uh, but it has led a uh, very long processional, all the faculty, uh, the governors, the senators, the congressmen, the presidents and vice presidents of the university. But in the forefront are the three chiefs from the uh, three largest tribes. So the Choctaws and Chicktaws, and they're in full eagle dress. So I would think you might have the Cherokees at least uh, come in full eagle dress here. <laughs>